Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, hear success stories, and learn tips and principles for bringing out the best in everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Deborah Rue, and this is Human Potential at Work. I'm the CEO of Rue Global Communications, and we are disability inclusion and accessibility strategist, working with multinational corporations, helping them understand why including people with disabilities is good for their bottom line. Today, I'm very excited about having this guest. This is a gentleman that I sort of tracked down and um, said, you've got to be on the program. And, um, and we're going to really talk about um, uh, deaf, deaf culture, hard of hearing, and we have an expert here and he is joining us and he has the sign language interpreter um, that he's watching and he will be signing and speaking at the same time. So I, I really, I, I know you're going to love this guest. So today we're welcoming John Macko to the program and John, um, if you don't mind, can you tell the audience about who you are and what you do, because it's very exciting, the work that you do. Hello, Deborah. Um, thank you for having me on the show. Um, you're right, I would be signing voices myself. I have an interpreter. She's sitting next to the monitor, so she's gonna help to facilitate the communication for us. So I do rely on sign language interpreter when I'm communicating with hearing people. Yes, I can speak for myself and understand that I was born deaf, but my family didn't know I was deaf until the age two. Wow. At the age two, I wasn't even talking, but my mom noticed there's something wrong with John. So my mom asked people in the family, I don't think John can hear, but people in the family, some friends saying, there's nothing wrong with John. John is a boy. Boys are known for developing their language skill later in life. He said, it'd be okay. My mom said, okay. Maybe a month later, I'm still not talking. Then one day my dad show up, came home, arrived home from work. My mom approached my father and said, I think John can't hear. My father said, okay, take, the two, take my two sisters and myself to the living room, play with the toys. My father goes to the dining room with the wood floor. My father had a, um, imagine this, this is a tin tray. What did my father do? He takes this, you know, like that. Both of my sisters responded, not me. And my mom, see, he can't hear. Then my grandmother read in the newspaper, we um, hearing testing at Children's Hospital. So we went, found out, every hearing loss. Now the doctor told my parents, your son has two options. One, learn the sign language, or learn how to talk. My parents chose the second one, learn how to talk. So I went to see my speech teacher every day from two to five every day to practice talking. Then when I started school, I was the only deaf person in my school. But anyway, I had a speech teacher. I went to see my speech teacher three times a week from six to 12. Then from 13 to 18, two times a week. That's how I developed my ability to speak with hearing people. It took a long time for me to learn. I didn't start feeling comfortable talking with hearing people until I was 14 years old. It just took a long time to feel comfortable. So, so I have a hearing law and that's how I decided to go to NCHID, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. It's located in Rochester, New York. The National Technical Institute of Deaf is one of the nine colleges in Rochester, New York. When I was a senior in high school, my speech teacher, who's also had a parent, encouraged me to go to RIT and NCHID, and I never heard of it. She said, you gotta go. And I said, why should I go? She says, the awareness level is high. The faculty there, they're comfortable having deaf students in the class. Kids at RIT and NCHID, we have a total of 1,100 deaf students from all over the United States that go to school in Rochester, New York. Understand that you're not required to know sign language to go to NCHID, but, but you are encouraged to learn because learning sign language made a huge difference in my life. I never realized how much information I was missing growing up because when I was in elementary, middle, and high school, 
I, I rely on speech training with my teacher, my classmate, but I never realized how much information was missing until I arrived at college, where right now we have more than 145 sign language interpreters on campus. If you don't know sign language, that's fine. Then we have more than 60 captionists where we, we have a, a laptop in front of us. We have a caption in the classroom. We'll listen to the professor and the students talking. They'll be typing and the students will be reading. And that's how our deaf students are able to get quality education through RIT and GIV. So, and right now I am a director of the Career Center at NGIB. My team is responsible for educating and training students how to find jobs, the deaf and hearing students find jobs. We don't find jobs for the students, but we give the resources, like we teach them to develop the resume, the cover letters, um, process interviewing, how to apply online, and so on. We also work with companies all over the United States and other countries to make them feel comfortable with the idea of hiring deaf and hearing students. And that's, that's, there's more story for me to tell you how we work with the students, how we work with the employer. But that is, that is who I am. And I'm, I want to say thank you for having me on your show. Thank you. Thank you, John. You know, it, it's, I have been so fascinated with the deaf and hard of hearing community and for, for a long time. And I've also, I, I don't know very much sign language to like nothing. I, I can say thank you, uh, but I always have felt um, like I'm missing something by not knowing it because I watch, I'm around people that are deaf and hard of hearing a lot and I watch them communicating and it is such a beautiful language and it feels to me that it is a language that allows you to uh, express yourself broader than I can express myself with language. Now I. I speak with my hands because it's just who I am, but I, I am just fascinated with the beauty of sign language. But at the same time, John, it scares employers. They think that maybe what we're saying is that if they hire somebody that's deaf or hard of hearing, that they also need to hire a sign language interpreter or two to walk around with them entire day. And so they think, oh, the cost is, I, I, I can't do it when that is not true and and, the, and then there's others that think oh well technology has solved all of these problems so it, so it, there's a lot of misinformation about it which i think that that's one reason why i've been following your work and the work of ntid because it, it's it's so interesting for me as a person that can hear watching and learning and listening to this community. And I'm like so many other people, I um, I watched with fascination Switched at Birth and that series, and it was a cute little fun series, but I learned so much about deaf culture and the pride. And so, and these actually, because of the pride in the culture, these are employees that you want in your corporation. Corporate corporations should be seeking this, these employees, but the, there's just so much misinformation. So that was one reason that I really wanted to have you on the show. And uh, I also am fascinated um, with your story about you as a baby, because I think the, the, uh, in the first place, I think your mother was amazing and very perceptive to know, you know, not that I, I hate to use the word something was wrong, maybe I would like to use better, something was different. And the, the reason why I say that, John, is because as a lot of my audience knows, I have a daughter that was born with Down syndrome. And the, when she was born, this weird little thought floated through my mind. I mean, I'd just given birth to her that, boy, she looks like a baby with Down syndrome. And I immediately thought, what is a baby with Down syndrome? I had, I, I had never been exposed to the Down syndrome community. So, and of course I d dismissed it. And four months later, when they told me my daughter had Down syndrome, I remembered the thought, but I think us mothers sometimes have, uh, and fathers as well, have innate sense about who um, are the, these, these human beings are. But I, I would wonder why, um, because people drop things all the time where there's loud noises and, you know, would, it just is surprising to me in a way that it took 
multiple years for your mother to be vindicated that yes, you know, John it does not hear uh, the same as everyone else. So I, I'm fascinated with that part of your story. Um, and I don't know if you wouldn't mind, you know, elaborating a little bit on that a little bit more. Oh, sure. Um, it, it's interesting. You use the word different. Understand that when I was growing up, I knew I was different, but I never could understand why it was different. Okay. Yes, I can talk, but I felt different. I never felt I, I was I was connected with hearing people, especially in, this, in the school environments. I never understood that until I went to college at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. That's where I met over 1,100 deaf artists from all over the United States that came to Rochester, New York. For the longest time, I thought I was the only deaf out of hearing student, you know, because I never met another deaf out of hearing student growing up. So I knew I was different. I couldn't understand why I was different until I went to college. And I realized we all have the same um, experience, you know, pros and cons, where how we communicate with hearing people, what are some good communicate strategy to communicate with hearing people. And coming to NCHID changed my life. I became a better person. I became a strong person because of NCHID. If not for NCHID, I don't know where I'd be right now, but I am very grateful. So it's interesting when you use that word different, but you're right. The deaf had of hearing, they're very proud to be deaf and of hearing. They, they cherish their culture. They cherish the language. They appreciate it. It's just very convenient. It's it, like, like you say, it's a beautiful language. And it's interesting when I'm working with company all over the United States, during my presentation, I always ask people, do you know sign language? And most people say, no, I don't know sign language. Then I say, suppose I told you that all of you know more than 200 words in sign. Ooh. Like, no, 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 no. I go, yeah, right now, all of you know more, more than 200 words of sign language. Like, no, no. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I say, you ready? We go, yeah. Then I, was, I would ask them, so I'm gonna ask you, because you know some signs, so I'm gonna ask you, Deborah, how would you sign the word phone? Right, phone. <laughs> How would you sign the word computer? Mm, I guess maybe. Right, right with the matter and you're typing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yay. <laughs> okay, you ready for a hard one? Okay. How would you sign the word credit card? I, I might try doing this. Okay. But when you have your credit card, what do you normally do with it? Oh, I swipe it. You swipe it. I swipe That's it. how you sign swipe it. See, now, it's a beautiful language. It's it beautiful is beautiful. Language. Now, we'll do one more. Okay. How would you sign the word ketchup? You know, you put ketchup on your hot dog or hamburger. Now, let me give you a hint. Use it in a bottle, you know, made out of glass in a bottle. How you get the the ketchup out that or oh yes 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 the Heinz yes and I love it. Wow. so you and I can go we can go on and on and on so I always tell people believe it or not we all know at least 200 words in sign language and people don't realize that my point is the reason why I raised it during our presentation working with companies makes feel feel comfortable with the idea of hiring deaf people I said look we mean the deaf out of hearing, we can't improve our hearing anymore. We cannot learn to hear better. We cannot learn to talk better. But you have the ability to learn sign language. If you start small during the conversation, pick a word there and there, from our experience working with the deaf person, we really appreciate it that you are using some sign in the workplace. Although I will tell you this from my experience in interacting with hearing people in the workplace, many don't feel comfortable. They feel foolish, they feel silly, especially in the workplace. 
but I, I always tell them, you know what? You know, we, we appreciate it. We can teach them to learn sign language. So that's the message I always share with people. Number one, you know at least 200 words of sign language. Number two, we appreciate that you learn it during the work, in the workplace. And I think you bring up such a great point, John, because I, in the work that I do, I have always felt guilty that I don't know sign language. And I have had people tell me, I don't know why, but almost try to intimidate me about, well, you know, it's a language, it's a very complex language, and you're not going to learn it overnight. And so then it almost scares me, and I think, well, I, I'm too old to learn it. And um, I, it's, so I love the practicalness of what you're doing. And this is also why corporations should be reaching out to you and learning about this, but also learning about all the amazing students that you have that are qualified to do their jobs. And I was just on a phone call with uh, Dr. Caroline Casey, where she's talking about the valuable 500, which is asking 500 CEOs all over the world to commit to adding disability inclusion on the board agenda. Well, that means hiring people that are deaf and hard of hearing, but I think that in the first place, I'm going to recommend you as a partner because I, it is important that the community speak for themselves. I, I don't think I, I mean, my husband has severe hearing loss. As he's aged, he's got severe hearing loss. His father was deaf before him. It runs in the family. I, I felt very vindicated, John, when I bullied him into going to the hearing doctor, the, the audiologist, and he had severe hearing loss, which they said, one of the things that he doesn't hear are women's voices. And I'm like, see, I knew you weren't listening to me. So um, he now turns his hearing aids off sometimes when I'm in the room, but that's a whole nother story. But it, it, what's interesting about these conversations is a lot of people are losing their hearing as they age. And so this is not just about employing people that are hard of hearing and deaf. This is also about retaining talent that are losing their hearing as they work for you. And that's why we need you so bad in this conversation, John, because in the first place, you made me feel that maybe I could actually learn sign language. And so one thing I want you to do during this conversation is maybe give us some pointers, but at the same time, talk about some of this. Because I remember, John, when I first started these conversations about employing people with disabilities, I would have the C-level suites tell me, we don't have anybody with disabilities working for our gigantic corporation. And I would say, well, how do you know that for sure? You know, once again, it took two plus years for your parents and your family to understand that you had hearing loss. And so I think this is why you and your school and everything you are doing are needed so much in these local, national, and global conversations. So I'll turn the mic over to you. Well, yeah, um, I forgot to mention that um, how deaf people become deaf. For me, my mom contracted um, the, um, the German measles during her first three months of pregnancy, but it, she had measles all over her body in the last of the three days, then it went away. But my, my family never made that connection until when the doctor discovered I was deaf. And the doctor asked my mom, did you have a German measles? My mom said, what's that? You know, it shows up in your body in the last few, few days. My mom goes, yeah. And that's how I became deaf. Other deaf people I know, they become deaf because they got hit by spiral meningitis. Some get in a, you know, in an accident, you know, like playing football. They get hit in the head, they become deaf. Or medicine, medicine, they become deaf. There's many different reasons why and how they become deaf. And also, it's interesting. You talk, um, you talk about your husband's. He started to lose hearing as he got older. But my experience interacting with people that lost their hearing later in life, for many of them, it's a huge adjustment. Not only for themselves, but it's also it's an adjustment for the family members and people in the workplace because they they don't know what to do. What resources are available? Where do I go? 
And oftentimes they were contacting me and I would occur to join the organization called HLAA, which is the Hearing Loss Association of America. That is a great organization for people who lost their hearing later in life. And, and at that organization, there's people that have a monthly board meetings, people go, and that's where they meet other people. Oh, again, they think they're alone. They're not. When they join, they discuss strategy. How do you communicate with your family members? What do you do in the workplace? What do you do? And that's, and that's what's lacking right now. People are not aware, where are the resources? Learn sign language. What assistive technology is available? What, what is the best um, way to communicate with the people in the workplace? Now, understand that, yes, I can speak for myself, but many of our students here at RIT and TID, some can speak but many prefer they rely on sign language interpreter or captioning to communicate in the, in school or in the workplace. So I just want to explain how do deaf people become deaf, okay? Now I want to talk about learning sign language. People always ask, how long does it take to learn sign language? Depends on your language skill. I always ask, have you taken a language in school or college and high school? And they said, yeah. How long did it take you? And some would say, well, I'm still learning. Some would say, it's hard. Well, some say it was easy. But from my experience, some individuals can pick up fast. Others, it could take a long time to develop your language skill, especially in sign language. So it's in the best way to learn sign language is to interact with deaf and hearing people. That is right. the best thing. Just like a spoken language, if you're interested in learning Japanese with Italian or Chinese, you need to interact with people that, that use that language every day. That is the best way to learn a language. And that will be my advice to you. Go meet a deaf person and learn sign language. Yes, I agree. Immersion. We know that immersion works best. So I agree. Yes. So um, thank you so much. I'm learning so much from this. So thank you, John. Um, I, I do want to ask you things like, you know, more about NTID um, and when was it when was it founded? Tell us more about the school. Sure, sure. I wish you were here. Oh, I want to come because <laughs> I would give you a tour. I would introduce you to some of the key people, especially the faculty, and the staff, and the students. You. That is the best way for me to educate a company to make it feel comfortable. I always invite them to come here on campus to give it a tour. That way they feel more comfortable because I would tell you when they first show up, they're nervous. They don't know what to expect. But after the day is finished, they're like, wow, this is this is this is cool. This is fun. I want to partner with you. I want to hire your students. So I wish you were here with me. So anyway, um, the National Technical Institute of Deaf was created in 1965, but in 1968 was the first year we opened the door for the deaf pedagogy. In 1968, we had a total of 70 students were admitted. 51 years later, now we have more than 1,100 deaf pedagogy students. So we have grown from 70 to 1,100 deaf pedagogy students. That's awesome. And you may be wondering why so many deaf have come to us in here. Well, let me ask you a question. You went to college, right, Deborah? Yep. Okay. Do you remember your first day of college? It was intimidating. <laughs> okay. What else? There was just so many people, and I, I didn't know what to think, and I was excited and scared to death. And... Right. Okay. Now, imagine you're a person with disability or deaf or hard of hearing. How would you feel on your probably first day even more, yeah, Probably a, even more to, scared to not know what to expect. Maybe afraid I was going to be isolated or lonely. Can I make friends? You know, so. Yes. Do I belong? Do I belong? Yes. Thank you. That is, that is the common um, answer that I get from the employers. I always ask them, describe your first day of work. And they, I mean, first day of college, they explain it. Okay, imagine you're deaf out of hearing. So anyway, I explain the awareness level is high here. 
the faculty named Seth were comfortable having that panel. We have a history, 51 years of history here. We have, my professional opinion, we have an awesome asset services where, as I explained, more than 145 sign language interpreters and more than 60 captions. That's how our deaf are able to get quality education. And also the faculty we hire, they are from a, they have an industry background. It could be manufacturing, engineering, science, computing, business. So NCID does, does a good job of hiring people with, um, with technical background. So we have seen study in the association degree where they're trained to become technician. We have deaf artificial student in the BS level program where they're trained as um, entry level professionals. So it's about half and half. We have about maybe 550 are studying to become a technician and the rest of the students are working on the BS degree or higher. So that's um, who we, we, that's who we train. So, and those are the employees that corporations are looking for with these kind of trainings, so. Yes, yes, um, in the social level program, we have a program called, well, we train students to become machinists. And that is a great program again too, because many companies, they can't find good machinists. So here we have a great machining program where we emphasize safety. You know, interesting talking about top three concerns that company have when they're thinking about hiring deaf people. Number one is communication. Number two is safety. Number three, they're not, well, it's a combination, but it's a combination of cost and they're not familiar with the product. For example, if you, if a company hired a deaf person and they ask, do you need any accommodation? And the deaf worker will say, yes, I would like to request a video phone there's a good chance that the hiring manager and the HR person, they don't know what a video phone is. Okay, that's an example. Or, or a deaf person say, I would like to request a sign language interpreter for a department meeting only. They don't need to have a sign language interpreter 24 slash seven, but they need it for a special um, situation for a department meeting or a training. So what a deaf person explains to to the HR, I would like to request a sign language interpreter. Again, HR to be like, where do I find a, a good interpreters? What what resources are available? They're not aware of that. But my team, I have a total of eight people on my team. When we're working with the students, we're teaching our students how to advocate for themselves. So when you can hire for a co-op or intern, or find a full-time job. We tell the student, it's your responsibility to educate the hiring manager in the HR when you say, I would like to hire an interpreter. It's helpful to let them know where to find it. And also, for example, if I'm a science student, it is important that when I contact HR, make sure they find the male interpreters. If they get a voice for me, that's one, because you don't want a female interpreter to voice me because it's, it throws them off. Number two, make sure an interpreter has a science background because you don't want to hire an interpreter with a liberal arts background and she joins the meeting and it's all these terminology related to science. There's a good chance the interpreter is going to feel overwhelmed or it's not going to be as smooth. So that's an example of how we work with the student. We educate the teacher how to advocate them during themselves in the workplace. Which is very important because I see, I see employers so confused about how to include deaf and hard of hearing employees. And I, I know that you can't do this in this short program, but what are some tips that you have for employers? In the first place, I just want to say, if you are an employer and you're not hiring people that are deaf and hard of hearing, uh, you, you're missing out. You are missing out on innovation because we know diversity provides innovation. So you really need to ask yourself why you're not doing it, especially now that you know John here, who is happy to send you some very talented students. But John, what would you say to an employer that really is, wants to do this? How, how do they even begin? 
Uh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Number one, every year in the month of October during the National Disability Employment Month, we have an annual NCID career fair. This is a great way for the company to come here to meet our student from the AS, BS and MS level. It's a great way for the recruiters to meet with our students. You know, number two, if they decide to come to NCID career fair, awesome. Also bring a deaf person. They don't have to graduate from NCID, IIT, they don't have to, but they are a role models to come here because you need to understand our students who are 18, 19, 20 years old, they never met a successful deaf people in the various occupations. So for example, this past fall, we had a total of 54 companies that came here. We also have 54 deaf representatives and 44 have graduated from IIT and HIV. It was an awesome moment for our students to interact with these deaf representative because the message we're sending to our student, current students, if they can do it, our student can do it. It's the one win, but some kind of company would say, well, the deaf, he doesn't know HR. I say, they don't need to know HR. They don't need to recruit, but they can, they can share their experience. What is their secret for being successful in the hearing environments? How do they communicate with hearing people? Do companies provide signing of character? What assistive technology are you using in workplace? That's how our students learn. It's a win-win, so that's one. Number two, I mentioned invite them to come here on campus. We'll give you a tour, meet with the students. They will show you the, the project they're working on. Also introduce to the faculty. They give you a quick overview of the program. Number three, my team, we travel. All the United States give a presentation how we can work together. We discuss communication strategy. We have a program called Working Together, Deaf and Hearing People. It's, it's a fun workshop. In that, in that workshop, we have a listening exercise where you can, it's, it's an audio program where you're gonna hear 12 interview questions. Certain sounds can be filtered out and the participant have to guess what they're saying. The point is why I love this, even though I have a hearing aid, I can hear but I can't understand everything. For example, if you and I went to Japan, we're in Tokyo, we're on Main Street, we're going to walk. I don't know, do you know Japanese language, Deborah? No. <laughs> no. Okay. But can you hear them talking in Japanese? Yes. Yeah. Can you understand what they're saying? No. That is the best way for me to describe my hearing loss. I can hear everything, but I can't understand word for word. I may catch a word there, where that's why I have Gail with me. So I want to be sure I understood everything you said. And that's how I communicate with hearing people. Um, so, so we offer that work. We also have a video program called the speech reading exercise, where we have four different scenarios. The narrator is going to guide you, and the, then the voice will be turned off. You have to guess what the person's saying. And again, hearing people think that deaf people are awesome speech readers, I say, you be the judge. So after they finish this speech reading essay, they realize this is hard. Right. Oh my God, they don't realize it. So we give them a taste what it's like to be deaf and of hearing. And that's how we build the relationship with the various companies from all the United States. And, and you know, um, I know that I know that we're probably out of ta time because I could speak to you for days. Uh, but I just want to make a comment to you. I I do a lot of speeches, and we're talking about you know disability inclusion and accessibility and making sure everybody's included in the workforce because this is good for all of us for this to happen. But it still surprises me um, how often we're having these conversations and and, and the, the meetings aren't accessible. I, I recently was invited to keynote speak at an event and I won't say which one. And the people said, the organizer said, well, you don't need a microphone, just project your voice. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. 
no, that is not an accessible meeting because I can scream as loud as I want, but if a participant is deaf or hard of hearing, or as you said, John, you can hear me, but don't understand all of the things I'm saying, then I can scream as loud as I want. And if anything, I'm just being annoying to you, maybe even worse. And so I think that, that there's so many problems and with true inclusion for people that are deaf and hard of hearing in everywhere, but certainly in employment. And I also see, um, I, I remember, um, and they, there was a, there's a conference in enabling that um, always has deaf speakers. Um, and, and so one thing that they found was, you know, when you have deaf speakers, you have to provide sign language interpreters to the speakers and then sign language interpreters to the audience. And they're not, that's not the same. And so they were saying, well, Deborah, um, who, what, there are all these other disability inclusion conferences. How are they doing it? John, you're not going to like what I heard and I, I won't repeat who I heard it from, but from multiple of these conferences, they said, well, we just don't invite people that are deaf to speak. And I thought that makes me very, very sad. That makes me very, very sad. I think that is a loss to society. And I, I think we can do much better. So that is one big reason that I wanted to begin a conversation with you. I'm hoping, John, that not only can I get you involved in some of the global and national work we're doing, but also that you will come back on air and maybe you could even bring some of your amazing students on air to talk about experiences. Um, but I, I wanna give you a chance to tell the audience, especially employers that you must hire people that are deaf and hard of hearing. You must. It's you are just doing your company a disservice if you don't do that. And so, how do they find out? How do they get in touch with you, John? How do they find out about NTID? How do are I? I know y'all are on social media. That's how we connected. Tell the audience how to find out more about your work. Well, um, if you were to Google NTID Center Unemployment and that we have a home page. It's really nice. It's built for the student and for the employers and visitors. If you're an employer, when you click on it, click on the employer session, there's all kinds of resources that's gonna make you feel comfortable with the idea of hiring deaf people. There's communication strategy, there's assistive technology, there's workshop. We also talk about what what um, program our students are studying, what skills are they learning, what are the requirements. We have, every, and also, I forgot to explain that, when I'm working with company, for example, if I'm working with company A, and I'm selling this, the idea of the higher dependent, and the company's not feeling comfortable, I say, you know what? Would you feel more comfortable if I gave you the content meeting from company B they have hired many of our students. They'll be happy to share their screen with you. And company A will say, yeah, that's a great idea. And that's another strategy that I've used because like you said, Deborah, there's a lot of work to be done, be done. And, but we're not alone. We're working together as a team because you and I recognize this, this is why we're doing this. We're here to educate the world about what resources are available. So the best way to learn more about NTID Center and Employment is to go to, to Google it and you'll find information about my department, how we can work with you. That would be the best way. Great. And what we'll also do um, on the episode, we'll provide links and we'll provide a link to, you know, the day that they have that he mentioned. And I really, really encourage employers to reach out because more and more, especially our younger generations, we want everyone included. It, the reality is there are, you know, 1.23 billion people in the world that are over the age of 55. I'm one of them. And as some of us start leaving the workforce, I'm not ready yet, but we need to use all, we need to employ anyone that wants to work. So it, it, for innovation, you're talking, you know, when you're thinking about artificial intelligence and the technology and all the cool stuff, you want innovation and diversity, hire somebody that's deaf and hard of hearing. They have, 
such different experiences that can add great, great value to an employer and a company's bottom line. So I really encourage you to reach out to John and his group and to find out more about NTID. And I'm hoping he will come back on air again and continue to um, teach me sign language, number one. No, continue to um, educate all of us on the value of bringing employees that are deaf and hard of hearing and keeping employees that are deaf and hard of hearing in your workforce because this is good for everybody. So John, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed talking with you and you're right. You and I can, we, we can talk all day. I mean, we, we have a similar background, similar challenges. I'm sure we have many, many stories to tell. So I look forward to, you know, stay in touch with you. So thank you for having me. Yes, I agree. And thank you to Gail for helping us as well. And the rest of your team, Patrick and all the, you had an amazing team. I was really, really impressed with the quality of your team. That's just one example of why we need to hire people that are deaf and hard of hearing in our workforces. So John, thank you so much. Thank Bye everyone. Bye.